So, um, what have I gotten myself into? This is a new talk that I wrote, that I finished writing maybe like an hour ago. So, uh, you know, I hope it's good. Let, let's go. So, uh, my name is Alex, and for some reason, Topi let me do a talk here, even though I explicitly warned him it would, might be weird and strange, and he let me do it anyway. So, here I am. Uh, I do incident response, and some, I uh, just started doing some red teaming at Atlassian. And also, I'm apparently, I looked on Twitter, and apparently, I'm helping organize this conference now. Ooh. Uh, it's called PurpleCon, and it's New Zealand's leading line distribution center. Uh, today, no, wait, not today. Uh, last year, some people, no, two years ago, some people wrote about me, and they wrote about a blog post that I wrote. And in their news article, they referred to my blog post as a blog post written by a hacker who goes by the name Alex. And so that's my, that's my hacker name now, and also my real name. <laughs> we're, we're, just roll with it. That's what I'm doing. Um, in university, I studied computer science and cognitive psychology, which is a pretty uncommon mix. And so, specifically in honors, I research how cognitive biases affect the workplace. So, I hope I can share some of that with you today. So, you know how software and locks have vulnerabilities in them? This morning in Jack's talk, she talked about vulnerabilities and locks, and I'm sure you've all heard of vulnerabilities in software. Well, so does the way we think. So, if your brain was software, what software would it be? Like, which piece of software? I don't know about you, but mine would be this software, because <laughs> it's unreliable and isn't really used anymore. So people are discovering... <laughs> thanks, I'm, thanks, I'm trying out some new material, so thanks for laughing. <laughs> Alex, I think you'd actually be millennial edition. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear whatever this guy's saying because there's no microphone, and I'm, unfortunately you're too far away from the recording microphone, so I don't think that got recorded. That's, just, that's a real shame. So, um, you might be, this is an example of SQL injection. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't know, sorry, I didn't know we were doing heckles. That changes everything. <laughs> so this is an example of an SQL injection attack. Some of you might have seen this before. It's some code that most of the time works and does the right thing. But somebody has cleverly crafted some input that makes it do the wrong thing. And so you might be looking at this and being like, ha, huh, you dumb computer. You interpreted the facts completely wrong, and now you're doing the wrong thing. Well, in this picture, which square is lighter? Square A or square B? You don't have to say it out loud, but commit to something in your head now. So the answer is they're both the same. They're both the same shade of gray. But it sure looks like that one of them is lighter in this picture, doesn't it? Like it sure looks like square um, B is lighter. It's my first time. And, um, but what's going on? Well, how come, like, what, when, when, you see these two, when you see these two squares, your brain like, gets it wrong and looks at, the, looks at the two squares and says they're lighter, even though they're the same color. And so you might be thinking, ah, but Alex, that's just an optical illusion. I didn't actually make the wrong decision. Your talk is flawed that you should be thrown off stage unceremoniously. And maybe, look, maybe. But for the rest of this talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about how it's just as bad for how we make decisions. So um, when I first heard that there were all these like, problems with, like, when I first heard about these things called cognitive biases, I was, I was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think there's problems with the way I think, because I'm young and invincible. But then as I heard more and more about them, I was like, oh. Yeah, I, I do that. I do that all the time, and it's also wrong. Hmm. And so it's kind of like when you find out that you have some vulnerable software, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm at risk of that. Hmm. So in this talk, I'm going to try and teach you as much as I can about these biases, and specifically, I'm going to teach you what they are, how they go wrong, how to weaponize them against your enemies, and how to defend against them. And I'm going to do almost all of it by example, because I think the only way to learn is by getting got. So let's do it. Let's begin. Um, so imagine there's this person called Sam that you don't know, and all you know about them is that they're soft-spoken and gentle. Is this person more likely to be a piano tuner or a salesperson? You don't have to say it out loud, but commit to something in your head now and think about it. Is this person, so you don't know who they are, they're just a random person, but they're soft-spoken and gentle. Um, so everyone's committed to something, I hope. I'm committed to doing this talk. Uh, I think this is not a real person, and I have no stats to back this up, but I think that this person's more likely to be a salesperson. And the reason is because there are hardly anybody's a piano tuner, right? Do you know, do you, does anyone actually personally know a piano tuner? That's, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Does anyone personally know a salesperson? Yes, statistics, I did it. And so, but I, I think a, a lot of you would have thought that they're more likely to be a piano tuner. I got got by this, uh, by something like this. I made this one up, but I got, some, I got got by something like this. And I was like, oh, why did I, why did I get that wrong? That's so obvious. Well, it's actually not that obvious. And so when you're answering this question, you, like, you, don't, you don't actually know this person, so you're just going to have to do it statistically. You have to figure out which one is more common. Is it soft-spoken, gentle piano tuners, or is it soft-spoken, gentle salespeople? And 
uh, I deliberately chose soft spoken and gentle as something that seems like it fits well with piano tuners. I don't actually know anything about a piano tuners, but I feel like someone who's soft spoken and gentle and spends a lot of time hanging out with pianos that sort of matches. <laughs> but I don't know if I, I, people don't think of salesperson salespeople as soft spoken. I think of them sort of more more confident or something. I don't know. I did just make this up. No citation. Just trust me. So in this, uh, in this example, there are two parts of it. The evidence is the specific information you know about the person, that they're self-spoken. And the base rate is how likely is some random person who you don't know anything about, how likely are they to be a piano tuner or a salesperson. And in this example, salespeople are way, 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 way more common. But I specifically chose the evidence to be something that matches a piano tuner better. And that was to particularly exploit this bias that I know people have. I've noticed, a bunch of actual scientists have noticed, and I read about. And, and the, the bias is people ignore this part. People ignore the base rate, they ignore the statistical chance of a particular thing happening, and they just focus on the specific information that they have. And this is called base rate neglect, because that's the base rate and it's neglected. And I've noticed it happens a lot. So here's some more examples. People might see an IP address from Russia and be like, hmm, that, that, might, that must mean we've been hacked, because, you know, oh, I've, I've, you know, there's a lot of Russian, I've heard a lot about Russian IP addresses that are hackers, so this Russian IP address must also be a hacker. And so it's easy to jump to conclusions like that, because we're always hearing in the news how the news just says Russia is hacking things, like the whole country or something, I don't know. But like, what is the base rate of that? Like, how many Russian IP addresses are hackers? Probably not very many of them, most of them are just people in Russia. And so this is an example of base rate neglect. I've seen people jump to the same conclusion, but they're like, oh, it's from Russia, it must be bad, but really it's just somebody who lives in Russia. Another example, have you ever been, have you ever been on a plane and heard a noise and like the plane creaks a bit and you're like, oh well, I guess that's it. Guess I'm going swimming. That's it. Um, uh, this, is, this is it for the plane. Uh, I guess um, I'm not wearing my swimmers and my phone's going to break. And that's such a shame. And I was supposed to update the, my phone OS, but at least now I won't have to do that because I'm about to go into the ocean. Because like as soon as I've, as soon as I've heard this creaking noise, it's like that means the plane's going to crash. Um, I definitely thought that. But really, I did some research and the chance of a plane crashing in 2016 is one in about a million. Because most of the time, planes just don't crash. Planes just go where they need to go. And it's like the vast, vast majority of the time they don't crash. Um, also, this statistic is averaged over all the airlines. Some airlines, like Virgin Australia, have never had a fatal accident, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, if you, statistically, if you wanted statistically to experience a plane crash, you'd have to catch a flight every day for 2,000 years. So probably not going to happen. I've made a convenient graph of this because I found out that it's way, way, way more likely that you're going to have a car crash than a plane accident. But why do we? People don't really worry about car crashes, right? They worry about plane accidents. Even though the base rate of a plane accident is so small, people still worry about it. And why is that? Well, don't worry, because I can explain with a math alert. So everybody get ready, there's going to be a lot of math here. Okay, here it is. This is, all, this is all I got. So the amount that you should worry about something is how bad it is times how likely it is to happen. And the chance of it happening is the base rate. And this is the thing that people forget about. People don't think, how likely is it to happen to me? They just think, how bad would it be if it happened? And the answer is a lot. I've made an extremely scientific graph to express this in visual form. <laughs> if that makes more sense, because this is how I think about it. The badness is pretty bad, but how likely it is is so, so, so small that when you times it by that badness, it's still very small, so not worrying about. Anyway, this has been my like, pre-flight safety talk. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> so um, I've, if we don't, I've just been saying wildly without any citation that we don't look at base rates, and if we don't, then what, what do we look at? Like, what do we care about? And uh, I, I think that the main thing that we look at, if we're not thinking about the base rate, is a coherent story, like a cause and effect relationship. Because if it's easy to understand something, it's easy to believe it. For example, if you saw somebody show up in your office wearing a fluoro vest, it's very easy to construct like a cause-effect relationship, a cause-effect narrative of how that happened. Oh, this person is wearing a vest because they're a tradesperson, and they're in my office because they're here to fix something. And social engineers know this. Like, they know that this is easy. This is an easy assumption to jump to. They know that people aren't really going to question, well, really? They're, they know that people are going to overlook, like, the unlikelihood of you being a tradesperson in my office today, talking to me, asking specifically to go to the computer room. But because the cause effect of, oh, I'm wearing a vest, therefore I'm a tradesperson, is so strong, people forget about it. Anyway, I have no motivation for this topic change, but we're now changing to a completely different topic. Imagine you're walking through the woods, not <laughs> thinking about computers, and you run into a mysterious wizard. And the wizard asks you to play a game. And here's how the game works. The wizard is thinking of a rule that applies to sets of three numbers. You may have heard this one. No spoilers if you have. The wizard is thinking of a rule that applies to lists of three numbers. Uh, th and he tells you that the numbers 2, 4, 6 fit the rule. And here's the game. Uh, you, can ask, you can tell the wizard any three numbers, and uh, they'll say yes if the numbers fit the rule, and no if the numbers don't fit the rule. And you can give the wizard as many sets of numbers as you want, and you'll get a yes or no answer back as many times as you want. 
But then you only have one chance to guess the rule. And if you, I don't know, if you don't guess the rule right, some sort of terrible wizardly thing is going to happen to you. So, uh, and also you've been told in advance that 246 fits this rule. So, one of the most common ways that people play this game is they're being like, hmm, okay, well, I've seen 246, so I'm going to guess 468. And the, they get, the answer they get back is yes. And they go, okay, I'm going to guess 8, 10, 12. And the answer they get back is yes. So they go, great. The rule is that the numbers go up by two every time. But is that the rule? Is it? No. <laughs> it's actually more complicated than that. Um, for the sake of this talk, does anyone, want to, someone, does anyone who's not heard this before want to try and guess what the actual rule is? Anyone? You don't have to. Okay, you had your chance. I'm just going to tell you then. So um, this, this test has an 80% fail rate. Most of the time people get this wrong. And um, the, re the actual answer, the correct answer to this, is that the rule is that the numbers are going up. That's it. The rule is that the numbers are going up every time. And the problem with this, the way people approach it wrongly, I mean, I got this wrong when I first saw it. The problem, the problem that people do is they have the idea in their head. When they see the 246, they're like, oh, the rule is that they go up by two every time. And the only examples that they ask for, the only numbers that they test, are ones that fit the rule they already have. They already think that it's two four. They already think that it's going up by two every time. So they provide more examples that agree with the idea that they already have. When really all they would do, all they would have to do is test one two three or something, and they would know that their idea was wrong. But people don't because people are so confident. And this is called confirmation bias, where you particularly look for information that supports the idea that you already have. And this is one of the most common ones and one of the most insidious ones. It's very easy to get caught by this. That's why I thought I would talk about it. For example, imagine if you're trying to prove that your company hasn't been hacked, and so you go to your logs and you search for all the times that somebody failed to log in. And then you say, see, nobody can log into this. We're, we're fine, look at, all these, look at all these people not logging in. And then people are like, mm, I don't know. So then you go look for more evidence of people not logging in, and you're like, see, we're safe. But really, you should look for signs that you have been hacked. And if you can't find any, then maybe you haven't been. So <laughs> when you <laughs> in conclusion, I can explain the following in entirely this expanding brain meme. <laughs> That's how you should solve these problems, right? It's, if there's an easy test to do to prove yourself wrong, you should just do it, right? It doesn't cost you very much to do a test. And if you can prove yourself wrong, you can save yourself a lot of like struggling along with an idea that doesn't make sense. And scientists do this all the time. It's called the null hypothesis, where you, know, you assume that you're wrong about your idea, and then you, uh, you find evidence that proves this hypothesis wrong. So you find evidence that proves the idea that you're wrong wrong. And this exists exactly to combat confirmation bias. Okay, time for another complete topic change. I don't have any motivation for this. Let's do it. So, uh, in English, are there more words that begin with K or have K as a third letter? Think about it now. You don't have to um, say anything, but commit to an answer in your head. More words that start with K or have K as a third letter? Um, when I did this, I was like, well, let's see. Words start with K. There's like knight and king and, I don't know, uh, crab. No, that's not right. Hmm. And thought of a bunch of words that start with K. And then, what has K as a third letter? Um, uh, maybe ask. Uh, I couldn't think of any more after that. And so I was like, well, okay, I can think of more that start with K, so it's probably that one. But actually, words that have K as a third letter are twice as common in English. But so what, why, you know, why, why does that happen? Why does everybody, why does everybody get this wrong? Uh, it's because it's easy to think of examples of words that start with K, but it's hard to think of examples of words that don't, uh, have K as a third letter. This is called the availability heuristic, which is that if you can think of a lot of examples of it, it's good or it's true. So for example, there's an example on the next slide, I don't know why I'm trying to make one up. For example, um, when people think about what are the security problems that could happen to me, what are the security threats to my life, ransomware comes to mind really easily because it's in the news all the time, right? Like maybe not this audience, but like in general when people think, hmm, what kind of hacks could happen to me? People think about ransomware because it's in the, it's in the news a lot and so you hear about it a lot. And so the availability heuristic might trick you into thinking that ransomware is the number one thing you should worry about and you should invest all your time into fighting it. When really, the main threat you have is something that's not immediately available, like all the unpatched Windows XP machines you have, or your password being something super obvious, or, something, or being reused, or something like that. It's easy to fall into that trap. This also happens all the time with security in companies. Uh, many companies didn't have a security team until they got hacked real bad the first time. And then they, then they were like, hmm, okay, we should probably have a security team. So why does this happen? Why do companies not make a security team until they get hacked? I think it's because before they have an incident, the idea of, oh, we could get hacked, isn't immediately available to them as something that could happen, because it's never happened before, so why would it? 
But once it's happened recently, once it's actually been an incident, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that, that, happens. that happens all the time. It happened yesterday. That happened again today. Okay, maybe we should have a security team. Maybe we should do all of this. And that's where the idea of don't waste a good incident comes from, where people are like, yeah, now that we've had an incident, we can fix everything because everyone's thinking about it. But after the memory wears off, the, the risk to them of being hacked stays the same, but because they're not thinking about it as much, they don't invest in it. So it's kind of insidious like that. Anyway, I spent quite a bit of time on those individual biases, but now I'm just going to do as many as I can as fast as I can. Hopefully, you can learn something from that. Let's go. So there's a supermarket in America that sold cans of soup at 10% off. And sometimes they had a sign that said limit 12 per customer or 4 per customer, and sometimes they didn't. And they sold more soup when they, when they put a limit on it than when there was no limit. And this is because uh, putting a limit on it, saying limit 12 per person or whatever, uh -huh. makes the soup seem more scarce or rare. And so people are like, oh, well, if it's a limit of 12, I better buy 11 so I get, you know, I get, the, value worth it. I get the value out of it. This is called scarcity bias. It's used by advertisers to create artificial scarcity in the hopes that you'll buy something. Uh, because people associate something being rare or exclusive with it being good, even though there are many rare and not good things, like rare diseases or exclusive events, which are kind of just like ads secretly. Okay, next one, let's go. So would you play this game? Would you press a button that gives you, has a 90% chance to give you $10,000, but has a 10% chance to lose you $50,000? And I'm not saying, do you think it's good to press this button? I'm saying, would you actually press it if it was in front of you? It makes statistical sense for you to do this, the expected value, is it your game money? But people are, so, people are quite afraid of that small chance of losing $50,000, right? And so this is called loss aversion, because people in particular d don't... People rate losses. <laughs> yeah, some of, you, some of you are laughing about that. Um, we're, so we're loss averse. So people in particular rate the loss of something much higher than they would the gain of the same amount, uh, because we're sort of really afraid of risks. In particular with small risks, either we like a 10% chance of a risk, we either ignore it completely or worry about it way too much and be like, yeah, it's definitely going to happen. When really, really we should worry about it 10% of how bad it is. Okay, next slide. Yeah, let's go. So, uh, have you ever been to like a website and it's like, yeah, sign up for this thing. And it's got like a four or five step sign up process. And when you get to the very, very end of the sign up process, it's like, cool, now give us your credit card. Or now give us your money or whatever. And it asks you to do something that's kind of quite high friction. Um, one of the reasons people do this is because by the time you've already filled out steps one, two, and three, you're at the end and you're like, okay, well, I'm already so invested in this, so I may as well just do this one last thing. And this is, uh, because you're already invested, you're less likely to quit. And so you can use this in your phishing or social engineering or uh, engagement or whatever they call this kind of advertising. This is called the sunk cost fallacy, which is the tendency to not cut your losses. Once you've already invested in something, you continue investing in it even if it might not make logical sense for you to actually do that. So people might say, oh, well, we may already keep using this bad software from the 90s because we all already know how to use it. But really, it would be much better if you just threw it away and started again with some new software that would not continue to ruin your life every day. That was a made-up example, nothing specific. Um, this also happens because when people spend more than something is worth to fix it, or people are being like, no, I'm not going to change my mind because I've already decided. Okay, next, next slide, man, let's go. Um, okay, I guess we're doing this. How, how credible is this advice about lead shielding? I don't know, but when you, I think the actual advice is quite credible, but when you see these slides, it's like, ooh. I don't know, this is kind of a mess and it's kind of hard to read. And your opinion of how easy the slides are to read affects your opinion of how credible the advice is. I've, I've summarized this idea in this meme. Oop, in this meme. <laughs> so uh, the, the, even though the actual advice is really good, even though the actual science is real, um, the presentation of it affects your opinion of it, when really it shouldn't. Really, how much you think the science is true should not be affected by how pretty or ugly the slides are. This is called the halo effect. Where, something, where your opinion of one area of something influences your opinion of the other areas of something that are completely independent. So if you, think you're, if you think the slides are messy, then your opinion of the content will be lower. If you think someone is attractive, your opinion of their skill will be higher. And if you think a product is pretty and has good UX, you'll think it has less security vulnerabilities. But really, there's no reason to believe that. Or maybe there is statistically on average. OK, next one, lightning round, let's go. Um, so if you saw this headline, Elon Musk denies tax fraud scandal, what will you remember a month later? You'll probably hear someone will mention old musky, and you'll be like, oh, the tax fraud guy, yeah, sure. And if you saw this headline, which is Elon Musk definitely commits tax fraud, everybody agrees, no denial, it's all straight up and down, this is not a, this is not a controversial statement, in a month you'll still remember the same thing. You'll still remember like, oh yeah, the tax fraud guy. Um, I, don't know what this, I don't know what this is called, um, <laughs> but I've noticed that uh, we don't really remember whether someone denies or might have done or definitely did something, and uh, we don't really keep track of where we heard something. Like if you read something in or a peer-reviewed paper, or I read something on BuzzFeed, you might not remember in a month or later. And you treat them equally when you're thinking about your own opinions of something. 
Okay, lightning man, let's go. Still lightning. So, uh, imagine that there's a surgeon, and they perform, like, a, they're doing, doing their regular surgery, and they're doing a low-risk operation, but something unpredictable happens, I don't know, and that causes the patient to not survive. Was this the right thing to do by the surgeon? This happens all, often, the surgeon will be blamed, and everyone will be like, no, you were a fool, that was too risky, you shouldn't have done the operation, you shouldn't have taken the risk. But really, they just got unlucky, right? They made the best decision with the information they had at the time. Right, there was nothing they could have, they did, they did the right thing, they just got unlucky. And this is called outcome bias, where you judge a decision not by the information they had at the time, at the time but you judge it by how well it turned out. It's kind of like someone was like, it's kind of, if you're like, hey, last month I bought a lottery ticket and I won. Everyone's like, wow, you're a genius. How did you know to buy a lottery ticket then? You're so smart. Wow, maybe, when should I buy a lottery ticket? And they start asking you about it. But really, you just got lucky. So people judge a choice based on how well it goes, not on the information you had at the time. Okay, lightning round. Still lightning. Let's go. Uh, intentional blindness. Okay, this one's my favorite one, and I'm going to do it by example. Um, I'd like to do a small pickpocketing demonstration. Could somebody who I don't know and who thinks they'll fit into this jacket that I prepared earlier, would anyone like to come and join me on the stage and be part of a pickpocketing demonstration? Put your hand up if, you, if you're keen. Promise nothing bad will happen, and I won't take your actual stuff. Someone who I don't know, Emily. <laughs> How about you? Sure. Do you think this, this, is a, this jacket is size medium? Let's try it on. <laughs> Thank you for coming up here. This one's my favorite bias, so... Also, it might not be a bias, but whatever. I just really want to do this. Thank you. And um, what's your name? Brett. Brett. Thank you for coming up here. Sorry to get you to do this whole jacket thing. So, see if this fits. Oh, we have a lot of jackets. How's, it, how's, everyone's, how's everyone's day going? How's... I promise I'll stop here. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, here you go. It might not fit, but have a go. Yeah, it looks great on you. Okay. So, no. <laughs> Ruined. Okay, so, uh, can you come stand over here? Yeah. So, I put some stuff in the pockets of this jacket, um, so I don't have to actually come stand in the middle so everyone can see you. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, can everyone see okay? Yeah. Um, so, I put some stuff in this. All right, okay. Like at uh, the front of the table? All right. So, oh, you put your stuff on top of my stuff. That's okay. Maybe. Um, so, thank you very much for coming up here and being my like magician's assistant. Um, I prepared a magic wand for you. Could you hold on to that? Okay, thank you. So, for this demonstration, <laughs> we're going to be. Oh, that's okay. It's your first time. Yeah. Uh, could you stand on this side? I'm sure I could get a tablet for it. Okay. So, um, for this demonstration, I put some stuff in the pockets of this jacket already, so I don't have to use your actual stuff. You don't need to hold that anymore. Thanks. Um, so, on the outside, we've got some sunglasses, and in this outside pocket, we have this book, and this book represents, I don't know, a book of secret stuff. It's actually a blank, but whatever. Um, on the inside, we've got, why don't you take it out? On the inside, we have this, like, pocket portable Game Boy thing. Check it out. Show these people what it is. So this is, like, a thing that I got on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. It's, like, uh, it's not really important what it is. But, yeah, it's got a terminal on it. I installed Nmap on it. I'm pretty sure you could hack someone with that. Please don't, though. Could you come and put, 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 that, put that back in your pocket? And could you take a step over here so you can be on the other side? Totally. Thank you. We can get that back in the pocket. Oh, yeah, good luck. Yeah, no. So, um, in this pocket on the left, you have this thing, which represents like an access Last card glasses. badge. Thank yeah. you, thank you. They're, they're a lot like the ones you had earlier, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty similar to those. Um, on the left, you have this access card badge thing, which represents like, you know, getting into a, some building that you're supposed to have. You can, you can keep that. And on the inside, why don't you show them what's on the inside pocket? Why don't you show them? There is no inside pocket. Are you sure? You got something? Are you sure? It looks like there's something in there. Maybe you should get that checked out, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I think I should. <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming up here. You've been a real help. Um, it's, been, it's been great to work with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you should take that back. Thanks, Doctor. Okay, thank you. And also, could I have my jacket back, please? Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll take them off. There you go. Thank you very much. And yeah, as, a, as a reward, I'd like to give you these lovely jackets. I think they'll fit you perfectly. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take them back? No. Okay. What are we talking about? Oh, yeah, intentional blindness. I have no slides for this, but um, the short version of this is if you're not paying attention to something, you can't see it. So this works in, like, the physical world. That's how pickpockets work. They're, like, uh, telling you to, like, like, I mean, you saw in this example. If you draw someone's attention over here, they're not looking at what's happening over here. But this doesn't work just in the physical world. This totally works with ideas as well. If you give somebody something controversial or emotional to think about, they're not going to think about the other parts of what you said. Uh, okay, lightning round. Final one. Let's go. Uh, the, the final one is called bias bias, which is that it's easy to see all these faults in other people, but it's hard to see them in yourself. Because it's harder to see faults in your own thinking, it's easy to see somebody else making a mistake and being like, yeah, what a bozo. Okay, that was the lightning round. Thank you for being part of that. We made it. I'm proud of us. So, 
when are we most biased? What, at what times are we more biased? Is, there, is it possible to induce bias in somebody else? Is it, one of these times is when you're not paying attention. And so I don't just mean in like pickpocketing context. I mean, if you're doing something else at the same time, like driving, or if there's two, multiple people talking to you at the same time, or if you're holding a bunch of things, you're less likely to stop and consider the actual decision because you're thinking about other stuff. That's normal. It's like you only have so many CPU cores. Also, if you're tired or like, you know, drunk or whatever, then you're less likely to think about things. I think you know this. I don't think I need me to explain this to you. In these situations, you have less chance of catching yourself making one of these mistakes. Uh, one of the other times when people are biased is when they're experiencing cognitive dissonance. And there's a great story that involves a fox to explain this, so I'm going to tell it to you. The story is called The Fox and the Grapes. One time there was this fox walking down the street or something, and it saw a bunch of grapes in the tree, and it was like, yum, grapes. And <laughs> so it was like, hmm, can't wait to eat these. But then the fox jumped, and it couldn't quite reach the grapes. And it tried to climb the tree, but the tree was too slippery, so it couldn't climb to the grapes. And tried to like parkour up the tree, but it still couldn't do it. And as much as the fox tried, it couldn't reach the grapes. And so it had, it had two ideas in its head at the same time, right? It had the idea of, I want to eat these grapes, but also I can't reach these grapes. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling, to have two conflicting ideas in your head. It sure is for me. And so sometimes, just to make that painful feeling go away, people jump to wild conclusions. And so in this example, the fox was like, oh, I can't reach the grapes, but I want them. The grapes are probably sour anyway. Yeah, the grapes are sour. They're probably not even good. And the fox just left. But really, like, you don't know, the fox doesn't know whether the grapes are sour, just can't get them. But it's easy to jump to, like, totally irrational conclusions or whatever conclusions you can to make that feeling of having two conflicting ideas go away. That's called cognitive dissonance, and it makes us have more biases. Okay, so what should you do now that you've seen this talk, now that you know about all these brain vulnerabilities? Uh, firstly, don't go around being like, yeah, I know everything about the brain now. Don't go around being like, my playground? Well, that would be the human mind. That's not cool. <laughs> don't do that. That's like, a common side effect of, that's like a common side effect of seeing these things. Um, the easiest way, if you want to avoid having biases, is to do a test. Test your ideas. We don't really do this very much. We just think things. But if you want to know if something's really true, do a test. Measure the actual world. Measure something about the world that you don't know, because the results won't lie to you. But your choice of test and your interpretation of the, of the results definitely might lie to you. So one of the other, one of the other techniques you can do for this is have a pre-mortem. So it's like a post-mortem, but you do it before you've done a thing. So imagine you're planning a startup or a project or anything. And before you do it, you say, OK, imagine it's a year from now, and the thing, the thing that I'm trying to do has failed completely. What, could have caused, what was the cause? It's not what could have, because you're imagining it's definitely happened. So it's already happened. What, how did we get to the situation? How did we get to our thing failing? That will help you come up with some of the obvious, well, not, maybe not obvious, that will help you come up with some of the likely things that could cause your thing to fail that you might have been overlooking because you were too optimistic. Uh, also, having, having, if you're doing this in a group instead of just one person, having diverse thinkers helps a lot because people who think differently will experience different biases at different times so they can cover each other's biases. So by diverse, I mean people with different backgrounds, experiences, what they had for lunch to that day, anything. Uh, one, a good example to think about this is who would win? All of the Avengers or like a lot of Captain Americas and one long Captain America? <laughs> right? Obviously, it's better to have these different and varied people than just a lot of the same thing. OK, almost done. Uh, there's actually one last bias in this talk, and that bias is the halo effect. And some of you might be thinking that, Alex, you already talked about that one. And I did already talk about it, but I actually gave you two examples of it, but I only explicitly called out one of them. Early in this talk, I told you a lie, hoping the halo effect and some other biases would cover it. What was it? Anyone? Yes? Do you work for Atlassian? No, I do work for Atlassian. Good one, though. <laughs> what, what was it? Does anyone have a guess? It's OK if you don't. Nope, okay. So even though I've never talked about it, even though I've never really talked about it before today, or brought it up in any way, or provided any evidence for it, did I really study psychology at university? I said a bunch of true things about all the other biases, and I've like come to one of these conferences before, so that kind of makes me seem credible. That's an example of the halo effect, right? Your opinion of the other stuff I've done uh, affects your opinions of the stuff I'm doing right now. Also, I said I studied computer science and cognitive psychology, which is, and I said it's a pretty uncommon mix. It has a pretty low base rate of happening. Also, I'm pretty sure you can't study that. Maybe you can do two degrees or something. Really, I studied computer science and math, and I learned about all these biases from reading books. In conclusion, trust nobody, not even yourself. Do your own research. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we can do questions. We have like one minute. So we can do like a question. Yep. Or you can come up to me after this and ask me all your questions about biases and tell me how your palace is the human mind. All right, bye everyone.